All right, if folks could take their seats and settle down, fill in, not the very front row because of um, uh, distancing requirements, but fill in the other rows so we look like we are um, having a full house-ish. Um, all right. Thanks so much. Um, we are going to follow the usual format for our graduate research symposium. So we will have uh, two uh, student presentations uh, followed by our keynote presentation. Um, and we'll do the introductions as we go. Um, and then around 3.30 or so, we will mosey out to the uh, atrium uh, for the uh, judging of the student posters, which are out there. Um, We've scaled back a little bit this year with fewer posters and fewer people here, but uh, uh, still it's great to be back in person to see faces all together and not in little boxes. So uh, thanks everybody for coming. Um, we'll go ahead and uh, kick things off with the first student talk, which will be from Ted Groth. Um, and his PhD advisor is Sriram Nilamegam, who will introduce him by video because Sri Ram is serving on a NIH study section today and can't be here. Hello, everyone. I'm really sorry that I could not be here at the Graduate Student Symposium since I just serve on a study section at the NIH. However, I did want to introduce Ted Groth. Ted comes from a small town or a city close to Philadelphia. And if you've ever met him, you know that he's the nicest person to talk to. He's an extremely patient person to talk to people and to listen to them and to converse with them. And along the way, he's helped a large number of students in our program with bioinformatics and biostatistical analysis. So Ted comes to us from University of Delaware. He did his bachelor's in chemical engineering with a minor in biomolecular engineering. He worked in the laboratory of Terry Papazakis on the genetic manipulation of E. coli and Clostridium and he came in 2017, so about four or four and a half, four and a half to five years back. When he joined the lab, he had a project that was just starting up, that was funded by a company called Pallion in Boston. And they were asking us to do bioinformatics analysis of the cancer genome atlas. So their question essentially was they had drugs that they were bringing up to the clinic. And it's very well known that drugs work on some people, but they don't work on other people. So you need to stratify patients in groups that basically dictate whether the drug will work or not. So this is a project more related to precision medicine and Ted's contributed to that and he discussed that um, as part of his presentation. But along the way, I did want to mention some of his other accomplishments. He helped us design a really nice CRISPR library that he published with Yuki um, in glycobiology this year, which basically knocks out pretty much every gene that's available for cellular glycosylation. He's also done a lot of data analysis on exome sequencing and other things with Andrew Kilker in the lab to find out strategies in which um, Cas9 can be regulated to have high on-target and low off-target efficiency. Along the way, he's helped you send job, um, pick up on a website that's called virtualglycom.org and really been instrumental in bringing around cross-campus collaborations with a number of investigators. And I'm sure he's gonna talk about it today. So with a short introduction, I'd like to introduce Ted to give this fantastic presentation. Thank you. All right, everyone can hear me, right? Everything's good? All right, well, I know Sri Ram's not here, but I'd like to just say uh, thanks for the lovely introduction, Sri Ram. That means a lot to me. And uh, welcome, everyone. And today I'd like to talk about my work, which is primarily relating how we can integrate omics data to understand glycobiology at a systems level. So before we go into that, I'd like to go over some preliminaries about what glycosylation is. And glycosylation is a very important biological process in which complex carbohydrates, known as glycans, are added onto proteins and lipids. This is a very ubiquitous biological modification, and roughly around 50% of human proteins are glycosylated. You cannot avoid them. 
And these glycans come about by a series of actions of glycoenzymes, which are responsible for adding and removing monosaccharides from these glycan structures. And they act in very complicated, non-template-driven processes. It's a very complicated thing to wrap your mind around. That's why we study them in the lab. And finally, the resulting set of all these glycans that are created by these glycosylation pathways and these enzymes is the glycome. So it turns out that glycosylation is extremely important for the biological function of proteins. If you don't have the right protein with the right glycan, the protein does not function the right way. And this is really important, such as regulating things like protein-protein interactions, the catalytic activity of proteins, as well as regulating cell signaling processes. It's, it's very important. And when cancers or other diseases evolve, you can change the glycome and you can change these glycans that are present on proteins, and that can result in devastating effects. This could result in diabetes. Uh, glycans are also known to change in smoking versus non-smoking people. And primarily for the rest of my talk, I'm gonna focus on cancer and how glycans change in that disease context. So cancer is the result of a dysregulation in the body where some proteins that are involved in regulating many biological processes, they, they affect everything and everything becomes dysregulated. And glycosylation is no exception to this. And in cancer, glycans, number one, are known to be altered pervasively. And number two, something that I'd really like to point out is these changes in glycan structure can push the cancer forward and perpetuate the hallmarks of cancer. And when I mean hallmarks of cancer, I'm talking about these disease facets in this wheel here. Some bio people may recognize this wheel where the common pathologies associated with cancer are shown on the outside. Things like uncontrolled growth of cells, evasion of cells from the immune system, uh, uncontrolled signaling and angiogenesis, the creating of new blood vessels to sustain tumors. Um, what I'd like to point out is on the inside of this hallmark circle, there are glycobiological facets feeding back into all of these facets of cancer. So I'd like to really emphasize that cancer and glycosylation sort of form a feedback loop where the development of cancer can cause changes in glycans and those glycans can also change the disease. So it's really important on how to understand how cancer is changing glycans. So as I mentioned previously, we have a pretty good idea of what is changing. There are many mass spectrometry studies being performed currently to better characterize what are the structures changing? How much are they changing? We can quantify this. So the what I have highlighted in green because we've got a pretty good idea of how to do that. However, we don't really understand how these glycans are changing in cancer. Is that as, as I've previously alluded to, glycosylation pathways uh, are influential in creating these glycan structures. There are enzymes responsible for doing these pathways, and they are encoded in the genome, and they are transcribed as genes. So we need to understand how this process of regulating gene expression related to the glycosylation process is regulated. And that's the focus of my work today. That's what I'm going to talk about. And the way that we do this is we integrate omics data together. And omics is kind of a buzzword in the field, and I'll break it down a little bit here. So briefly, a verbal description of what omics are is the high throughput collection of biological molecules. It's amazing the technology that's developed over the past 20 years. Uh, in one experiment, you can measure the gene changes, the mutations of genes, the amount that they're expressed. You can measure all of that, all, all 20,000 genes in one experiment. And in the field of biology, there are several different kinds of omics. Uh, there's epigenomics, which is how the DNA is regulated by its shape and other binding proteins. The genomics, which mainly focuses what are the genes encoded, what are the changes in these things, the way in which they're transcribed, the proteins that are made, and also, how are the metabolomics changing? How is the metabolism changing? And glycomics is fed into this as well. But for my talk, I'd really like to focus on these four things and how they relate to one another. And two main research questions I'd like to talk about today that I've addressed in my research is, how are cancer processes regulating glycosylation? And that's mostly an interaction between the epigenomics and the transcriptomics field. And finally, we'd like to understand how do these glycogen expression changes, how much are they changing? What processes are these involved in? What types of glycans can we expect 
by analyzing this level of data. So in order to help us do this, uh, as Srira mentioned in his introductory uh, speech, we have this enormous data set called the Cancer Genome Atlas, which is a compendium of over 11,000 cancer patient transcriptomes, measuring how much genes change across 36 different cancer types. And associated with this is clinical metadata, such as age, the sex of the patient, health history, tumor grade, and chemotherapy treatments, as well as cancer molecular subtypes, which I'll go into later. So this data set will help us understand how glycosylation is systemically dysregulated amongst many different cancer types. But before we go jumping into the analysis, we need to have a very firm understanding as to what we're studying in terms of glycosylation. As I mentioned previously, glycosylation is a series of enzymatic reactions that happen in a certain order to predict, well, to create certain glycans. So in the lab, we manually curate this information by reading textbooks, uh, going to databases, and we manually curate the function of 374 different glycogenes, which can all be viewed on our database, which I'll mention at the end. Uh, these, gly these glycogenes are regulating 150 different glycosylation pathways that we want to understand how they're changing in cancer, as well as 135 different enzymatic functions that we're interested in. So using this knowledge, we can take, we can look at how cancer uh, pathways are related to glycosylation, and we can also measure using the transcriptome how much a glycosylation pathway is dysregulated. So the first aspect I'd like to talk about is how cancer is tied to glycosylation. And that is mainly done by a series of proteins called transcription factors. These proteins kind of think of them as molecular dimmer switches. If you turn it up three quarters of an amount, it'll change the gene expression by a certain corresponding amount it has a fine-tuned control over gene expression. But unfortunately, not much is known about which transcrip transcription factors are regulating glycosylation. So in order to help us do this, we've taken data from other databases which have integrated uh, transcriptomic data and epigenomic data. So back on the bottom here, I'm sorry if it's hard to see, but what, I, what this Cystrome Cancer Database is doing is it's measuring the strength of a transcription factor's ability to regulate a gene by measuring how far away it is from the glycogene it's regulating, as well as measuring the amount of how transcripts are correlated together. So these two metrics are used in order to assert how strongly a transcription factor is regulating something. And after this, we can use these metrics to figure out which transcription factors are global regulators of glycosylation, as well as what types of communities of transcription factors are regulating different glycosylation pathways. And so summaries of the, of the results are shown here in this grid where we have a glycosylation pathway title on the y-axis as well as the different cancer types analyzed on the x-axis. The dots show that transcription factors were enriched and the size of the dot rec uh, represents the number of transcription factors. And the degree of statistical enrichment, like how sure we are that these transcription factors are regulating these processes, are in higher degrees of red. Now, one interesting finding that I'd like to point out here is that we found an enormous enrichment of this type of glycosylation, O-linked glycosylation, in pancreatic cancer. Now, when you go back to the literature, and we have collaborators in Nebraska that work on this as well, and they've, they've identified two particular glycogenes that change upon cancer development. So once cancers develop through the development of cancer stemness and EMT, they can change O-linked glycosylation. But in turn, these O-linked glycans, these O-linked glycogenes that are changing, they can also feed back into the same process that caused it. So again, this is the idea that there could be feedback loops in the development of cancer and the presence of glycogenes and the changes of glycans. So this is one thing that I thought really uh, exemplified this relationship between how cancer and glycosylation can cyclically perpetuate one another. Additionally, if you take a network approach, a community detection approach, uh, you can cluster transcription factors into communities based on the glycogenes that they similarly regulate. Think of this as like a Facebook network. This person knows this person knows this person. Transcription factor one regulates the same glycogenes as all of the other transcription factors here. So we were able to do a community analysis to discover this. And interestingly, we were able to find several cancer 
types of pathways uh, perpetuating glycan structures. So inflammatory pro uh, processes in cancer, which have been shown to be upregulated, uh, they can cause changes in these sorts of sialic acid structures, which are really important for cancers to evade the immune system. So we can link inflammatory processes to this. Additionally, chromatin remodeling, which is the change in the configuration of the shape of the DNA, which is really important for gene expression, can regulate the general upregulation of N-linked glycans. You can expect more N-glycans to exist in cancer. And uh, somewhat paradoxically, these types of structures, known as LAC-DINAC in the field, uh, they can contribute some sort of adhesive properties, which are important for pre preventing cancer from metastasizing. So it's a multifaceted effect that glycosylation has on cancer, and there's multifaceted pathways that are regulating these things. So moving on to the next part of my analysis, which is the understanding of how glycogen expression can become dysregulated in cancer, we wanted to understand a couple things. And this was mainly uh, feeding the work that Sriram previously mentioned. We had collaborators at Paleon Pharmaceuticals who really wanted to understand how the glycogen transcriptome is altered in cancer and what types of glycans can we expect. So this transcriptomic data can help us predict potentially what types of glycans to expect in cancer. Very important for biomarker discovery and the development of drugs. So in order to do this, we took several approaches using low dimensional embedding, a differential expression analysis, as well as developing a prognosticator uh, type of machine learning model, which I'll break down later as well. So first of all, uh, this slide takes a while to load, I apologize. Um, what I'd like to show with this plot is this is the results of embedding all of the Cancer Genome Atlas patients. One dot in this plot represents one cancer patient. And what I'm doing is I'm taking the expression values of all the glycogenes, all of the genes involved in glycosylation, and I'm measuring the similarity between every single patient. And that creates a plot like this, and every color that you see is a different cancer type. So clearly, there are different clusters for different cancer types, which means that glycosylation signatures are distinct for each cancer type, which means you should expect different glycans to be present in each cancer type. And interestingly, if you look at how different cancer types are related to one another, mainly if you look at tissues of similar developmental origin, they tend to cluster together as well. Breaking these cancers down more into molecular subtypes, uh, I know that this plot can be a little overwhelming, but the main idea here is each cancer type shown here has a molecular subtype, which was identified previously in literature from other prognostic gene expression profiles, or it could be related to clinically relevant variables such as tumor stage, uh, survival and things like this. If you take the glycogen transcriptome, as was done in the previous slide, and embed them in a two-dimensional space for individual cancers, you can see that there's some prognostic value here. They are separating based on these subtypes as well. So this means even in molecular subtypes of cancer, there could be different glycans distinguishing these things. That's really important to know. Moving on to a differential expression analysis, which, let me explain, is the analysis of how glycosylation gene expression changes in cancer with respect to control. How much can we see a gene change with respect to control? Um, in this case, normal healthy tissue. Uh, in this case, the change that's positive, if you see an increase in gene expression, that's represented by red. If the gene decreases in expression, it's represented in blue. And this heat map is showing for all these cancer types at the bottom here how much they should be changing on average in different cancer types. And as I mentioned previously, if you do a clustering, if you look at how glycogenes are dysregulated amongst cancer types, they cluster based on tissue developmental origin, meaning that there might be underlying processes in these developmentally similar cancer types driving glycogen expression to a certain way, which I think is really important to understand how to treat disease. Um, and this underlying mechanism, that'll help us develop more targeted therapies, identify more targeted biomarkers to better understand how glycosylation is changing in cancer. Now, 
as I pre mentioned previously, we do analysis of glycosylation pathways as well. And these glycosylation pathways are important for creating glycans. And we can quantify using statistical enrichment analysis how much we should see a, a particular pathway go up in activity or down in activity. The up activity is denoted in red and blue denotes down regulation. And what's interesting here is if we look in the literature and we look for orthogonal data, meaning can we see corresponding changes at the glycome level that match the gene transcriptome level, then we find a lot of evidence for this. We find evidence in lung tumors that this particular glycan is upregulated. We also see blood groups and lac-dynac structures in cholangiocarcinoma being upregulated. And it's also well known that gastric cancers are showing down regulation in this particular uh, pathway. But what's interesting as well is when people do small scale experiments, not using omics experiments, high throughput collection, they do targeted analyses of O-linked fucosylating genes in breast cancer. And we're able to re recapitulate this using high throughput omics as well. So our results are matching up at the glycome level as well as the low throughput transcriptome level, which means that Potentially, these glycopathway enrichments could inform us of new glycans to expect in cancer. And finally, what I'd like to discuss is work relating to how can we use the glycogene signature in order to separate cancers into molecular subtypes. And the way that we do this is I uh, developed a simple machine learning pipeline that uh, works like this. So we have our 374 glycogenes and we do this recursive feature elimination step where you fit a model 1,000 times where in each fitting, the number of glycogenes used in order to predict the molecular subtype decreases. You only wanna find the genes that are doing the best job. Once you find these sets of genes, you can tally up how many times did they end up in the top 50, which was an arbitrary uh, threshold that we set for this analysis. How many times did a gene occur in the top 50 most performant? Using these genes, we can titrate them back into a new model, which is the same sort of model, a support vector machine classifier. And you can add these features successfully, successively. And when the performance of this classifier uh, saturates, you know that you have your optimal model. And doing this process, we were able to develop a Glyco 30 signature, which was able to distinguish different subtypes of breast cancer. So looking at these glycogenes here, we see that the profiles in gene expression shown on the y-axis show a lot of discrimination between the different subtypes of breast cancer, which means that our machine learning pipeline is picking up important features. But interestingly, there's not a really clear story as to what pathways, what groups of glycogenes are feeding into a particular biomarker. There's no consistency here. But some pathways represented are glycosphingolipid synthesis, which I can tell you is important in the auto-activation of signaling pathways in cancer on the cell membrane. Chondroitin and heparin sulfate genes were involved, and those are very important in the solubility of signaling molecules. And terminal fucosylation, which is incredibly important for metastasis. So I'd like to uh, conclude by uh, showing everyone that we are using omics data in order to identify potential pathways in cancer that are coupled to the glycosylation process. Um, we also are able to use this glycogene transcriptional signature in order to identify dysregulated glycosylation pathways, as well as create prognostic signatures as well to identify molecular subtypes of the disease. And hopefully, we, we hope that these omics analyses will feed back into future glycomic studies to figure out how the glycome changes are related to the transcriptome. The glycogenes that are being transcribed, the, the abundance of their proteins should correlate to the amount that a glycan should change. So there needs to be more work linking the transcriptome to the glycome. Additionally, we could perform perturbation studies where we remove these transcriptional regulators from biology, these transcription factors I was linking to glycosylation, and we can then validate their activity. All of this work that I've shown you today is being manually curated at our website at virtualglycome.org, 
which maintains a glycoenzyme database, which stores the function of these enzymes that I was talking about today, as well as integrating these omics data that I was discussing. And additionally, the gene expression profiles, the glycogene expression profiles I was discussing today, I've developed a custom web application so that people can identify glycogenes of interest that are dysregulated in cancer. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. And uh, this is our lab group. I just wanted to say thanks to the lab for helping me prepare for today, as well as Sriram. They were uh, instrumental in helping me prepare for today. And I just wanted to thank everyone for their support. And with that, I'd like to answer some questions. Thanks for listening. probably affect the predictions a lot, but um, using the particular database um, in our analysis, the Cistrum Cancer DB, the way that they described the promoter region was a 2,000 base pair region behind the promoter. But you're absolutely right, there could be long range uh, interactions from enhancers that could be recruiting other transcription factors to that site. And these sometimes enrich because the data that we're collecting, ChIP-seq, uh, sometimes you can enrich those en enhancers near the promoter region because you know it's binding several hundred thousand bases away, but it could also be binding very close to the promoter as well. So sometimes you can get those enhancer regions depending on how the chip seek works out. So this is the you say that chip seek data, they're not methylomic, they're not methylation data. No, it's uh, it's mostly transcription factor data, chip seek data. Yes. Okay. So, hope that answers your question. So that depends primarily on the glycosylation pathway that you're talking about. So um, there's a particular glycosylation pathway that only happens on lipids, and that's initiated by a certain set of enzymes. So using that biological knowledge that we curate, um, we can start deducing whether it's a glycolipid-specific enhancement in cancer versus an N-link glycan instance or an O-link glycan. But What's tricky about glycosylation, I have to admit, is once those core structures of glycans get synthesized, there's a lot of crosstalk between the enzymes. They can function in an N-link glycan context, an O-link glycan context. And that's what continuing work in our lab is trying to address. How do we start doing a network approach? How do we integrate the core pathway and the non-specific pathway together to figure out how uh, cancer glycans are changing? So that's developing work. We're at the gene enrichment level right now, but network stuff can happen later. So it's known that glycosylation kind of changes the cancer development. Can you still relationship also in that glycosylation changes are what's driving cancer development or are they just happening? So I, so I don't think that the glycosylation changes are causing cancer. The development of cancer can dysregulate many biological processes of which glycosylation is one of. And those altered glycan structures from altered glycosylation can feed back into the cancer. I probably overemphasized this in my talk, but it's glycosylation is one facet that can make cancer pathologies worse, but the development of cancer can cause those glycans to appear, which can cause the worsening of the disease. So cancer is always the causal influence, the mutation of proteins causing this dysregulation. That's, that's the causal route. There's plenty of space.
space here. I was sitting alone in the second row. I'm trying to encourage people to come join me. I got two people to join me in the second row, but there's folks who've been coming in, sitting in the back, looking a little confused. If you come down that aisle and go in from that end, there are like 10 seats. You don't have to, but I'm just saying. Um, all right, if we could thank Ted again. Introduce our second student speaker. If you will.